So I'm super sad I couldn't visit in person. Dr. Pearson's project is is fascinating, and I've long wanted to visit some of the parks that uh, um, that that she's studying and this whole uh, ecological restoration thing. But but I I, I hope to um, get to visit them someday. I have a a secret uh, plan to visit um, Detroit in um, 2025 as part of a bike trip around Lake Huron. So we'll see if that happens. Um, in the past, we've had a bigger travel budget and uh, um, because of the pandemic too, this uh, we tried to uh, arrange a visit earlier, but weren't able to. But uh, I did get a chance to have some great chats with some of your students so that and um, uh, faculty. So that was a, a, a nice way to spend the afternoon. And um, so I'm feeling a little imposter syndrome here. Um, I'm not really gonna talk about the niceties of the statistics of causal inference or some super technical details. Um, but rather some pretty broad overarching aspects of why we might um, find it important to evaluate natural experiments for cancer prevention and control, um, and of course, some uh, um, funding opportunities as well. So a bit of a hybrid talk with a little bit of science and a little bit of my program director hat on. So hopefully there'll be a, a, a tidbit of interest to, to, to some of you or many of you, and I'll share a PDF of these slides um, um, if uh, you're interested, you'll be able to ask Madeline or, or Amber for them and, uh, um, you know, hunt down some of the links that are that are available. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, where I'm coming from and what we do, uh, why natural experiments are critically important for cancer control, an example of a natural experiment evaluation using uh, existing data. Um, and as you'll see, it's, it's a paper I, I led, so I'm able to uh, politely catalog its myriad weaknesses a way, as a way of highlighting um, sort of things we can do to strengthen causal inference from observational studies. Um, then I'll, I'll talk about some interviews we did with uh, grantees, including Amber, about challenges experienced um, in uh, um, uh, grantees who have received funding to evaluate natural experiments, and then some talk about the funding landscape here, which um, you know, the, the best way to improve causal inference is to get a big grant so you can actually do some science about it. Um, um, so a little, I think most of you probably know everything about NIH, but um, especially for the younger people, I'll, I'll tell you a little about NIH. Um, so, you know, our mission is to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, length, and life and reduce the burdens of illness and disability. So it's a big mission and it's a, a complex organization. Much of what I say is going to be oriented towards the National Cancer Institute here circled in red. And while it's a, it's a big institute, um, I wanna make it clear that it's you know one of many. And um, um, so we, we, but you know, we, we, the NIH gets 49 billion a year overall and seven billion at NCI. So that's a, a big player in the research landscape. Many other institutes are also quite large, two billion or more at um, infectious diseases, heart, lung, and blood, general medical sciences, diabetes, and digestive disorders. So uh, important players in this uh, funding and research landscape. Um, the institutes um, and offices at NIH are the main administrative units for research and funding. And they're organized based on several different themes by disease, cancer, or the Eye Institute. Um, um, sorry, that's an organ, um, um, the Diabetes Institute I was thinking, by organs, heart, lung, and blood, by both diabetes, digestive, and kidney, by stages in the life course, aging and children, um, by demographic groups, the Minority Health and Disparities Institute, by exposures and behavior like the Environmental Institute or the the Drug Abuse Institute, by discipline, the Nursing Institute. Um, incidentally, many of you might think, well, I don't work on nurses or nursing, so why would NINR be of interest? Its new leader, um, two or three years for a, a long now, Shannon Zenk, is reshaping the Institute to have a broad funding interest in community and environmental influences on health. So if, if you're in that arena, you might take a look at the Nursing Institute, since it might not occur to you normally, by methods like the Biomedical Engineering and Library Sciences Institutes, and just basic research generally, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. So 
the implications of this, um, um, you know, evolved rather than designed organization is that multiple institutes might be relevant to a research project, especially where a health behavior or environmental exposure could um, influence many outcomes. For example, physical activity research occurs at NCI, at the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, at the Musculoskeletal um, Conditions Institute in aging and children, um, et cetera. Similar, similarly, health and housing research occurs at 10 or more institutes. So it can take some effort and exploration to find relevant resources and opportunities. So I urge you um, to, to be patient. Um, the National Cancer Institute, where, where I work, um, its mission is to lead, conduct, and support cancer research across the nation to advance scientific knowledge and help all people live longer, healthier lives. We have seven divisions, 13 offices and centers. Um, and so again, a, a complex structure that can be, take some patience to navigate. Um, like many institutes, we're divided into intra and extramural activities. Um, intramural are basic epidemiological and clinical researchers embedded in a tenure system. This is a great place to look for a postdoc or a tenure track job if um, your interests are in this area. And then the extramural um, divisions are involved in funding, grants management, workshops, conferences, systematic review, and in some cases, especially in, in my division and in, in the division of um, cancer prevention in population-oriented research. So our division of cancer control and population sciences, advancing research in cancer control and population sciences to eliminate cancer and its consequences for all, and our vision, a world without the burden of cancer. Our director since 2021 is Dr. Katrina Goddard, um, uh, and she's recently established a set of key priorities and future directions um, that are um, summarized in a, a book that you can uh, download online. And, and those, those directions um, involve uh, health equity, data strategies, evidence-based cancer control policy research, modifiable risk factors, and climate change. So it's very exciting that a traditionally biomedical um, research organization is elevating um, policy research and modifiable risk factors in the prevention domain as key elements of what we should work on in the coming years. So um, I, I think that's a fantastic advance and, and we're in the thick of beginning to design you know, opportunities and invest in resources that will help address these key priorities even more than we already do. Um, so, um, in, in the next, uh, few slides, I'm going to share about some resources that we've developed rather briefly. Um, there's lots of links on these slides. Um, so like I said, you can, you can, um, get them again, but I wanted to give you the, the flavor of some of our investments in contextual and policy relevant factors that, um, uh, uh, might matter for cancer control. Um, the first resource I, I like to highlight is the National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity Research. Um, and the, our division, and, and me actually, um, lead uh, co-lead NIH participation in this collaborative, which is designed to accelerate progress in reducing childhood obesity for children with attention to high-risk populations and communities. Um, our leadership is based on the idea that we really need a life course perspective on childhood obesity. Obesity is a key risk factor for cancer at many sites. Um, and the biggest risk factor for adult obesity is childhood obesity. So from a prevention standpoint, we need to be addressing obesity from the, from the get go. Um, and um, NCORE is notable for having a wide variety of resources to help researchers um, the measures registry, a list of validated uh, measurement tools, a catalog of data resources, um, the youth compendium of energy expenditure, which uh, helps to translate um, uh, uh, frequency of behaviors into units of energy expenditure. Karen Pfeiffer, who many of you know at MSU, 
was one of the co-leads of that project. And um, she can, is also working on a new Encore project. So it's been a great pleasure to work with her over the years as well. Um, so I, I commend this resource to you. Uh, a second um, uh, topic that I'm getting more and more interested recently involves the important role of recess in child development and in um, uh, fostering physical activity in children as part of the energy balance equation. And I think some or many of you will recognize Kim Clevenger here. Um, Kim really opened my eyes to the importance of recess while she was a cancer prevention fellow with us um, in, until uh, just a year and a half or so ago. Um, she's now at, um, at uh, Utah State University and really thriving there. I, I speak to her often. And so I wanted to use this slide too um, to, to highlight the Cancer Prevention Fellowship Program, which has uh, uh, funded her postdoc and which is a fantastic um, postdoc, up to, up to four years. If you don't have a background in epidemiology, it sends you to school for a one-year MPH. Kim went to Harvard. And um, so if anyone is interested in that, um, check out the webpage there for the fellowship program and contact me. I'd be delighted to talk to you about it um, give your application a read. Kim, I met Kim when she was a graduate student, encouraged her to apply, worked with her, and it, it was a terrific fellowship for, for both of us. So um, a great resource. Um, a, another contextual influence on walking, this time uh, often associated with adults, involves a strong interest I have in, in, in walkability um, um, as a, a factor that can increase physical activity via walking, the most common form of physical activity in the United States. I think this, this work, and I've been um, uh, ad addressing environmental influences on walkability since uh, my first paper here at NCI in 2001, um, has been a, a big success of public health research and action. Local, state, and federal policymakers are all investing in walkability and walkable communities because of its community, economic, and health benefits. So I think it's a real example of how research ends up, um, if it plays out, translating into changes in social norms and uh, changes in the environment. Um, and I just show a picture here of a, a sidewalk um, that was just in, in, installed in my neighborhood um, last fall and kind of gives an example of a a small natural experiment. I'll touch on it a little more again in the future, but I'm very excited about having a sidewalk in front of my house now. Um, um, a, a, a few resources for studying um, walkability that I've helped develop. Um, uh, first with, with Chuck Matthews, who's a tenured investigator in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics here, is ACT24, a web-based previous day recall instrument that's um, been validated in a variety of studies and is designed to estimate daily summary values for physical activity and sedentary behavior um, in uh, humans. ACT24 is freely available for use by researchers, teachers, clinicians, and others. And it's composed of two distinct sites, um, one for researchers that helps manage the data and process it, and one for the participants um, so they can uh, be uh, alerted and then fill out their previous day recall on their laptops, tablets, or phones. You can try it out by registering a, a test study at our website and uh, uh, explore whether it might serve your data collection needs. The other resource that uh, I list here that I've helped um, develop over the years are the is in the National Health Interview Survey. So nationally representative data about walking for leisure and transportation and a module of questions about walkability addressing people's perception of the environment um, for walking. Is it safe? Are there trails? Um, are there barriers, et cetera? So we've published a, a, a series of papers about that, some of them listed on the previous slide, but the data are freely downloadable and there's many more questions to be addressed. Um, I think every PhD student should do one paper about some national survey data relevant to their concerns so they can get the flavor of the larger context of their work. Um, here, and this is almost the end of my listy slides um, until we get to the grant funding opportunities, um, are a few more lists here. We're getting very interested in housing as a social determinant of health, and we have an active um, housing and health work group um, um, a recent portfolio review 
and we're we're starting to work closely with HUD, the the um, Department of Housing and Urban Development, and they've created a beautiful new data portal listing um, data linkages between public housing projects and various health data resources. So a really cool opportunity for further analysis of administrative data. Um, I'm very excited about a, a project, uh, some $50 million project that we recently funded, um, a bunch of several centers looking at cancer control in areas of persistent poverty. This is part of our effort to do better at addressing equity and there's census to find areas where more than 20% of the people have um, been in poverty for um, decades. And so I think it's exciting that we're trying to um, uh, address this thing. One of the coolest projects there involves um, the researchers helped work with the city to motivate a bunch of developers and construction firms to um, um, restore and revitalize a neighborhood and the research team is doing um, pre-test, post-test studies to try to figure out what the effects on health and well-being of the residents are to have this major investment in their community. Other projects are looking at minimum basic income um, and a whole suite of, of, of specifically cancer-related topics. So very exciting work. Um, and a, a few other um, SDOH and community-focused activities. Um, oh, yeah. So here's a slide with some more information about the housing and health work group. Um, there's the data portal I mentioned. It's a neat collaboration. We need more collaboration between the major funders in different areas like here, CDC, HUD, and the NIH. We completed a portfolio analysis um, uh, earlier this year, um, just of work from 2016 to 2020. And we found a large amount of research on housing and health, some 565 projects combined, um, uh, mostly about neighborhood characteristics, relatively little on these key um, uh, economic issues like affordability and stability. And also most studies observational, a few intervention studies and a few natural experiment studies. So much more work I think is needed on the, the, the economic aspects of housing because clearly, you know, um, that's a, a growing challenge in the United States and a, a profound problem. So I think housing is a emerging frontier and we need a more coherent approach to it and we need more work to on interventions that can improve housing and document the effects of housing on health. So um, a lot of exciting stuff, I think, coming out of NIH in these amongst in, in addressing contextual and social determinant of health issues. Um, so uh, three slides now about why I think it's so important um, uh, and a major motivator, in my mind anyway, um, for studies of, of policy and natural experiments um, for, for cancer control and for public health overall. So, you know, in the, in the Cancer Institute, we're interested in these modifiable risk factors for cancer, which of course are modifiable risk factors for many other chronic diseases. Um, and the, here I'm, I'm showing a um, uh, results from a paper by Islami et al. Now about um, uh, getting a little older, 2017, but um, um, uh, not the situation is still similar. So this is uh, um, uh, uh, incident cancer um, uh, attributable to these different factors. Um, and for all risk factors, 42% of can incident cancer cases are, are associated with a modifiable risk factor. And the top, the top five are cigarette smoking, excess body weight, alcohol consumption, something that only about 40 or 50% of the people in the US are even aware that alcohol um, uh, causally related to cancer at multiple sites, UV radiation, and uh, lack of physical activity. Um, so clearly, if we want to you know, reduce the burden of cancer, we should address these risk factors. Um, and the, the, the issue is um, we have a, a library of individual level interventions where with um, coaching, drugs, uh, behavioral therapy of different types, we can help people change their behavior. The, the problem is um, there's an enormous population that needs these costly interventions and often the interventions especially for obesity, physical inactivity, alcohol use, do not last forever. So they might need to be administered repeatedly over someone's life. So 
for tobacco, there's still 28 million current smokers. Um, an estimated 108 million of people in the US have BMI greater than 30. I'm one of them. Um, 16 million people in the US are heavy drinkers. Um, in 2015, one third of US adults experienced one or more sunburns. And an estimated 129 million people in the US receive uh, um, less than 80% of the benefits of moderate to vigorous physical activity for mortality. So we need complex repeated interventions for 283 million conditions. So I think we need to continue to develop and make available effective interventions, but these can be complemented um, by population interventions where you do something good for the environment that fosters healthy choices. Um, this is not a new idea. Obviously, this is Rose's strategy of preventive medicine, um, but it's gaining some more traction at NIH, um, uh, you know, as, as the economic and systems burden of the individual biomedical approach grows larger and larger. And I think in some other organizations, um, there's there's always been and there there continues to be a growing influence in um, interest in policy systems and environmental approaches. But the challenge here is that population level interventions are hard or impossible to randomize. Um, sometimes you can, and we should strive to find cases where we can use a randomized trial to test these interventions. But very often it's observational studies, quasi or natural experiments that are the only source of rigorous evaluation of these population approaches. So I think this is a simple, obvious argument that you're all familiar with, but I feel we need to be making it all the time um, to help change our investments in uh, different approaches. Okay, so now um, I'm going to tell you about a, a natural experiment evaluation that that I that I led. Um, one of my a postdoc here wrote it up and use it just to highlight the fact that this approach is kind of difficult, but we have room to improve what we're doing. So um, uh, what is a natural experiment? Um, this audience knows this, but I'll say it anyway, because maybe you forgot. Um, ways of evaluating interventions using unplanned variation and exposure to analyze impact. Well, it's sort of planned because when you you know build a light rail system, you're planning for people to ride it, but you aren't thinking of it as an exposure whose health consequences you might want to measure. The intervention is not for research purposes. And if you study it and evaluate it and attempt to achieve strong causal inference, you want to sort of figure out if you are achieving an as if randomized comparison between exposed and unexposed. So as if random implies both known and unknown confounders are balanced in expectation across treatment and control groups. Um, so that's, a, you know, sounds simple, but it can be hard to figure out. And I think some of the examples we'll talk about later um, um, might help, but it, it highlights the need for, you know, geographic or temporal control um, and careful thinking about exposure to make sure that you're um, evaluation is is um, achieving, you know, as close as possible to the rigor of a randomized trial with the added benefit, too, of external validity because you're studying real things happening in the world and the diverse exposures that are occurring. Um, yeah, so for physical activity, one of my fav most important favorite areas, natural experiments are vital because we just can't explore all their influences with randomized studies. So it really is relevant to build economic and policy levers. And in, in theory can give insight into underlying mechanisms at, at multiple levels, as well as evaluate the specific investment. Um, uh, 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 the history of this, again, um, this audience might be familiar with this, you know, dating, we all remember in our Epi 101, um, the story of, of Snow's pump handle. So there you have it, a natural experiment. Um, uh, uh, more or less evaluated by snow. Um, and some people feel that this approach was sort of adopted or stolen, and that's a joke by economists and political scientists, um, despite important work by, by Cook, Campbell, and others in the health and education settings. Um, and But they certainly you know, ran with it, and I, I, it was so exciting in 2021 when the Nobel Prize was awarded to David Carr, Joshua Angrist, and Guido Embens um, 
uh, for the for their work um, um, showing have shown that natural experiments can be used to answer central questions for society, such as how minimum wages and immigration affect the labor market. They have also clarified exactly which conclusions about cause and effect can be drawn using this research approach. Together, they have revolutionized empirical research in the economic sciences. I think that's great. It's too bad there isn't a Nobel Prize in, in public health. Um, I like this text uh, by Thad Dunning from 2016, Natural Experiments in the Social Sciences, a design-based approach. Not much about econometrics or equations, but he really lays out the logic of natural experiments in a great way. And for your amusement, there was a, a terrific little NPR Planet Money episode, September 10th of last year, talking about natural experiments. So I got a kick out of that. Might be a good assignment for your undergraduates. Um, so here's the analysis we did um, uh, with Alex Budens, now at the FDA. Um, but I take full responsibility for all the weaknesses of this study. Um, the paper was called Awareness of Alcohol and Cancer Risk in the California Proposition 65 Warning Sign Updates, a natural experiment. Um, so California has had point of sale warnings that alcohol increases risk of cancer since 1986. In, in 2018, these signs were updated to include an informational P65, the regulation that mandated the signage, website link, and the update was associated with some media coverage and enforcement of warning requirements. Coincidentally, our survey, the NCI Health Information and Nutrition Trends Survey, asked questions about awareness of the link between alcohol and cancer before and after the update. So we were able to compare such awareness before and after. And so it's this natural experiment with this um, signage change to see if it had an effect on awareness. The HINT survey was administered um, um, all across the country with people in, in every state. Um, awareness of the link was assessed with uh, questions, so, so self-report, nationwide survey. There were three survey dates, 2017, 2019, and 2020, with the signage change um, uh, passed into law in 2016, but uh, actually implemented in 2018. Um, and um, here's here's the results. Um, um, there was no statistically significant interaction between location in orange, the other states, and in blue, the California, and time. So the, even though they look a little different, there's not a difference between uh, a year effect. Um, California does have higher awareness overall, although curiously, we didn't see it in 2017. We did see it later. Um, and um, um, but there was there there appeared to be no effect of the signage based on our straightforward analysis of the interaction in a linear model. So what's going on? So that was a little disappointing, but um, uh, it seemed worth publishing, and it sort of reflects the challenge of um, natural experiment evaluation with administrative data sets. So what are the weaknesses of this study? And this is intended to think about as you design your future studies. Um, there was a single time point for the baseline data. Did it have any idiosyncratic characteristics? Curiously, you know, the, the California and the other states were similar, although, um, and but different later. Um, the survey was not designed to be representative at the state level, so there's a chance of sampling error there. The survey items changed from 2019 to 2020, so the two follow-ups differed. We felt we could translate them into uh, um, you know, the same units, but oh, that requires some assumptions. There's no assessment in this study of actual exposure to the signage, so many people here might never have even seen the signs. Um, there was no control for alcohol use status. Um, in, in one survey year, we asked um, how whether people were um, uh, used alcohol or not, but in the other years we didn't, so we couldn't control for that variable. Drinkers and non-drinkers might well differ. Um, the exact timing of the exposure is a little unclear. It was initiated in 2016. There was a lot more coverage in the run-up to 2018 um, and more commercial activity around vendors selling signs, but we don't know exactly when the exposures occurred. Um, there could well be non-response bias. Hints has a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a 
a, a, a relatively low survey response. And of course, in relation to the as if randomized goal, California obviously differs from other states in many ways. And one might even speculate that California's Californians' historic interest in health might be relevant to their knowledge. So um, all of these sorts of things apply kind of in your thinking about every natural experiment study. And they are especially relevant in some cases to the using pre-existing administrative or survey data sets to try to evaluate these experiments. They just aren't designed for that. So they almost always suffer from uh, uh, one or more of these sorts of problems. So as I mentioned, here's the sidewalk, which uh, was an amazing experience of kind of a tiny natural experiment that I think highlights uh, some further problems. Um, this is a newly installed half mile of sidewalk. Um, it was a three year process um, to get uh, the 51% uh, of the neighborhood to agree to have this sidewalk installed. Um, uh, some of the neighbors sued the county to try to stop the sidewalk. Um, there were many stories in the press. Radio and TV teams came to the neighborhood and interviewed people. Um, and um, um, husbands and wives fought vigorously over this and wrote competing letters to the county to try to, in support of the um, sidewalks or to oppose it. Indeed, my own wife and I were on different sides of this story. But once it was built, now we see a lot of... Uh, um, older people and families with small children using the sidewalk and I rush out and do intercept interviews and they love it. So it's a beautiful, it is a beautiful natural experiment with an outcome, but of course it by itself is so small, you couldn't, you know, get a big grant to study it. So, and that's, I think a feature of these environmental interventions is often any one of them is quite tiny. And so it can be hard to sort of lump together a whole bunch of them to provide a very robust and generalizable evaluation. So um, that's a, another feature with these changes. Um, further challenges, um, I think I've mentioned a, a number of these, selective exposure, confounding factors. A big issue, and I'll come to this later, is a lot of times they're sort of time sensitive. It can be hard to know exactly when they're gonna happen. Um, they might happen right away, and then it's hard to collect pre pre-event measurements for a pre-test, post-test study design, or very often they're delayed for years. A classic example is the purple line, a light rail line here in the DC area that is now um, seven years late and and nine and six billion dollars over budget. We had a grantee who proposed to evaluate it. Unfortunately, she didn't get funded, but if she had been funded, we would have had to take the money away after a year when the project was delayed three years. So. Um, you're not in control of these events, and that is difficult. Um, but I still think we need to keep striving to to find these. So um, there, it's hard. It's 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 like the moon. It's hard to get there, but it's worth it. Um, uh, okay. Next up, here's a little project um, that where we interviewed some of our grantees, including Amber, about the challenges they experienced in trying to do this kind of work. Um, uh, this was, uh, um, we did the survey and then a summer intern of mine, Jen Shi, uh, coded the data and 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 um, tried to summarize it. Um, I see there's a, a chat. I, I'm just looking at it to make sure it's not for me. Um, okay, uh, there's a question in the chat. I'll get to that at the end, okay? Um, yeah, so, um, um, uh, right, so um, Jen Shi, uh, um, uh, terrific, terrific intern. Now she wants to be a surgeon. So I think she decided natural experiments were hard. Um, so this, these are grants funded by the Time Sensitive Obesity Policy Program and Evaluation um, uh, funding opportunity that's led by NIDDK. Um, it, Amber was funded through this. Um, primary contacts for that are Mary Evans at NIDDK. Um, and then uh, Layla at the National Institute of, of Child Health and Development, and Jill Reedy and myself at NCI. It's designed to investigate public policies, um, organizational, local, state, and national, and their impact on obesity-related behaviors and obesity. Um, so we funded 22 grants um, between 2013 and 2020. Um, five more have been funded so far. And uh, most of the grantees answered our questions, um, which was nice. Uh, a lot of the grants um, 
mainly talked about COVID since that loomed large. Um, indeed, uh, there was a grant that was awarded in 2013 who mentioned COVID, but they mentioned it in relation to um, you know challenges in getting all their data published. So uh, the the effects of COVID uh, are, are long lasting. Um, and so here's some examples of, of grants funded by this um, announcement, just to give you the flavor, and I'll show some more lists like this, but you can see things about improvements in public housing, um, use of the diabetes prevention program in an integrated health system, health effects of light rail lines, um, park renovations um, from New York and from um, uh, Detroit, um, and um, uh, later high school start times. And there's been a variety of other topics. So wide ranging policies and environments and programs. Um, what level of policy? Mostly local policies um, are evaluated, some at the state, school district, um, or pandemic related national policies. Um, and then uh, quite a lot of built environment work, but then as a scattering, food environment, healthcare, taxation. Um, so uh, a wide range of topics are amenable here. Um, uh, Jen, um, Jen, Jen looked at the um, questions about implementation barriers, successes, challenges, and lesson learned, and COVID-related issues. And, and she uh, coded and summarized um, uh, the uh, grantee responses. Um, uh, in the lessons and adjustments arena, um, uh, we, we cataloged quite a few tidbits that like a lesson learned is to collect emails as a form of content since people move their home address, but they keep their email. Um, obvious, but kind of clever. Um, I might also have sought to construct a synthetic control rather than a single similar, but not too distant city to minimize potential contamination. If you're studying a natural experiment in a city, it's hard to know. Everyone learns about it. Maybe even if it's not right near them, it, it might influence their thinking. Um, and a repeated lesson from everyone in response to every single question was building good relationships with our study participants and communities. That's vital to start early in your career if you ever want to go in this direction because you don't know when the natural experiment is going to come along. But if you don't have relationships, ah, it's going to be hard to make it all happen. Um, some of the top line further findings, um, uh, continued attention to participant recruitment and retention. Um, is that a question for me or, or a mic? Claire, can you mute yourself? Uh, 30 minutes and then we go dinner early or it just, you know, a, walk, a drive around the campus. Oh, okay. You know, yes. just, you know. All right, could you mute? Really, I don't think, you know. Can you mute? 30 minutes will make much difference to her. Can the, the host you know, should be able to mute stop. that person. Yeah, absolutely. Oops, um, sorry. No. Can the host do that, please? No worries, thanks. Um, um, okay, yeah, good community rapport. And, you know, some people said, and I thought this was interesting, is that the pandemic was incredibly difficult, but it gave them some new ideas as well. So that's a real glasses half full kind of investigator. So if the pandemic is still having lingering effects on all your work, um, uh, see if you can reframe it in your mind as, as a learning opportunity a little bit too. Um, yeah. So, so more tidbits. Um, funding for this the, these natural experiment grants was comparable to the NCI pay line, um, but you know that's ten percent, um, and so you, they demand excellent grantsmanship. Um, many of the the grants that don't succeed, it was very often inference and methodological issues. So, I think grantees need to continue to really up their design and analytical game. Uh, to short circuit some of those objections. There's a lot of conversation in review about the control groups and whether they're adequate. So I think geographic controls are, are terrific and valuable, but the synthetic control approach appears to be gaining a, a, a lot of influence. And there's an emerging literature in impl policy implementation and disimplementation science. And I think the natural experiment grants um, don't always address that literature and that thinking. So that could be a, a, another way to improve some of the grants. Um, there's still some, there's some aging, but still useful material from our 
2018 Office of Disease Prevention um, workshop, Methods for Evaluating Natural Experiments, so and an associated summary paper by Karen Emmons from Harvard. So you might check that out. And, you know, I think this is a really difficult, I was talking to Amber, this is hard, a hard kind of project to do, but uh, um, this can help make you feel like your work is has the potential for a greater influence on policy. And that's a beautiful feeling. Um, so last last few minutes, I'll, I'll go through these pretty quickly so we have a little time for questions. Um, sorry, I, I love to talk. Um, yeah, so these are the flavors of policy built to natural environment evaluation funding opportunities. Funding opportunities, we're calling them NOFOs right now, um, a mysterious change of vocabulary. Um, there are generic opportunities for sort of any topic and specific opportunities about some exposure or risk factor. There's opportunities that are time sensitive or not. They may be R01s up to 500,000 a year for five years or smaller R21 grants, say 250,000 um, for two years. A variety of different institutes and offices support funding in this area. Um, and you can always use Reporter as most of you probably know, to find grants similar to what you're working on, see, read their abstracts to get the flavor of how they, a successful grant talked about a topic, and scroll down to see the institute, the program director, and other tidbits about the, the grants. Um, so most grants at NIH are funded via the um, uh, unsolicited, investigator-initiated, or parent announcements. That's where we just say, send us grants that are about the, the Institute's mission. And so those are, and those announcements are not time sensitive. They have the regular nine month to a year timeline uh, for funding of an NIH grant, but there's many policy evaluation grants that are that are funded via that, that path. Um, a recent example of that funded by NIDDK but through the parent opportunity, is this grant health impacts of citywide zero fare bus transit, a natural experiment. Um, so it has a pretest post test study design, multiple city controls and synthetic controls with physical activity outcomes, but it wasn't time sensitive. They, they had a long warning of when this was going to all happen. And um, it, it was publicly announced by the transit department and stuff. So they believed it and it's happening. It's kind of a cool study. We'll see what happens. Um, um, then um, there's uh, a K, very occasionally there's there's a NOFO called an RFA, a request for application. These have a dedicated pool of money and usually one or two review dates. These three currently are expired, but just keep your eye out in the NIH guide or in touch with your informants about opportunities like this. They're they're kind of exciting because they're definitely going to fund some grants. The only downside is if they have money for three grants and a hundred people apply, then the yield isn't, isn't that good. But um, here's one from nursing, evaluating the impact of COVID-19 pandemic related food and housing policies and programs on health outcomes. So a, a natural experiment subject to evaluation that nursing funded and the proposals they received, some involved nurses, some didn't. I haven't seen the final um, list, but uh, a reminder to check out nursing. And then a really big project that is worth learning about, even though it's expired, the Community Partnerships to Advance Science for Society. Um, their health equity research hubs, and then a bunch of other activities designed to engage communities in the design of interventions that the community members think are most appropriate. So a, a very exciting and amazing thing for N NIH to do that. Um, yeah. Then these time-sensitive funding opportunities, the one I mentioned earlier for obesity policy and program evaluation, um, there's a very general one now from the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research, time-sensitive opportunities for health research. So this allows you know, a, a wide range of possible um, health outcomes and policies beyond obesity. Um, uh, a, a special mechanism for drug abuse research, especially inspired by the opioid epidemic and and its uh, sequelae. And then a long running RFA from uh, the Environmental Health Sciences Institute, um, uh, often uh, applicants for this study disasters. You know, if the if uh, there's a an oil well, the an oil well in the in the Gulf or um, 
the Twin Towers or events like that, um, it, it's a unique opportunity that you better get right on because it's just happening like the giant methane leak in Southern California. Um, so uh, that's a neat, a neat thing if you're keen on disaster. Um, so for the time sensitive one, I, I a little out of order this slide, but uh, I wanted to reinforce the point that um, we had 164 applications between 2013 and 2023 and 28 awards. So that's actually about a 17% award rate, um, not bad. Uh, differed a little amongst ICs, but um, uh, that's you can discuss that with your future program directors. Um, and average time to award was uh, was five months, so pretty rapid. Um, it would have been better than that, but NCI, uh, that's me, um, took 7.8 months. But that's not so bad because it turns out that number was inflated by the fact that we had two awards that were given with end of year money. And so they took 11 months to fund, but luckily they happened to be two projects where the policy itself was delayed. So the, you know, if the policy had started on time, we would have had to say, well, we can't give it to you. But luckily the, the policies were delayed so that uh, we were able to fund them. And it was a good, they were good policy evaluation experiments. Just it turns out that the time wasn't the issue. So um, we're not as bad as we look. Um, Further examples of grants, uh, I'll just leave that in there. That's just to show you more of the breadth of this funding. Um, and so conclusions. Um, an introduction to the work of, 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 of our division, um, an argument for policy evaluation via the natural experiment approach, a sample study where I showed how I can get science published even if it's riddled with weaknesses because it's an interesting idea. Um, challenges for such work at, at multiple levels, and then a, a hopefully a useful resource in the future, cataloging some funding opportunities in this area. So um, thanks very much and happy to, to stick around for as many questions as people have.